I don't think it matters very much. So, I don't know what you think about the previous lecture. It was a little bit, um, someone was asking like all the questions. Someone's really good at uh, linear algebra. Who was it? Yes, not here. <laughs> But there was not a lot of physics. So I want to flesh it out a little bit with physics. We had a few equations. The other eraser is too dirty. Yeah. We had, we talked a lot about this thing. What is this? Contraction, we don't have the dots in here, so it's just a, a matrix product. But what is the T? The T tilde? Um, yeah, so it's a tensor, it's a tensor of kinetic energy. Yeah. So, what are the elements of that tensor? What, what dimension is it? Hmm? What dimension is the tensor? Um, I'll tell you in a little bit. I guess well, I can tell you now. Um, number of degrees of freedom times number of degrees of freedom in the system. So it could be pretty big. M zero zero. Yeah. So you have what? What are you gonna have here? M zero zero. Yeah. No. M. N. M. First column. Uh, next column zero. Next column zero? No. Oh, so it's like a diagonal matrix? Yeah. Yeah, I guess in, in, in practice it will be. M I J? Yes. So I talked a little bit about this one. Actually, also. In general, you have the M's everywhere. So it's like you know, one, 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 two, so on. So how come you can have a, a, a tensor, or a, I guess in this case, just a square matrix uh, of masses that belong to, you know, that are not unique. I guess you have a different mass for each combination of um, I and J, of particles. Well, it's because there are certain uh, properties that your system must hold, and one of them is that it conserves, uh, conserves the energy. And so if you have uh, force constants, different directions, you know, you could have like this one or like this one, and um, you know, we have the potential energy distributed among two particles, or you know, in general, if you have a, a higher uh, rank tensor, it will be three particles, four particles, and so on. We talked a little bit about that. Then the mass has to do the same. It cannot be the velocity um, because of the way we did the approximation with the Taylor expansion. So if you cut it, you need to keep the this, this approximation to second order also. 
So everything has to be in these M's. Okay, so that's the first thing. So this tensor is all M's. Uh, what about the A's? What are they? They were column matrices. They are ruler column matrices. They are column matrices of what? The eigenvectors of the. They are the eigenvectors. Yeah. So what are the eigenvalues? Well, we had the lambdas, right? Lambda k, but what do they represent? Eigenfrequencies. Yes, so they are related to the eigenfrequencies. The eigenfrequencies are omega squared k. Okay, so we have a system. This is like extremely general. Um, I uh, really apply it to you know, systems of many particles, like especially in solids. But it is more general than that. You know, K is just the degree of freedom. Um, so you're going to have N degrees of freedom. OK, so what we proved um, by looking at the properties of the force constant tensor and the, uh, the kinetic energy tensor which are uh, Hermitian, so they are square matrices and they have all these properties. Uh, by looking at the properties, applying everything like you know, in one uh, way and then in the reverse order, we were able to show that this uh, product is real. Yeah, makes, makes sense. Um, you know, I did say that it was real and positive, but I'm not positive about the second one. Oh, that's a horrible pun, sorry. Your ears probably hurt right now. So, you know, let's see. From the, from the physics point of view, what is going on? Um, there's one more thing that I'm going to write right here. The eigenvalue equation is this one. Uh, this is equation 6.15 or 16. And then, <laughs> hell. If we multiply times this one on both sides, then we have this one, and over here we have this other one. So because this one is real, you know, it's just it's just going to be a number. We can put it down here, and it's going to be dividing. Is this going to be a number, a scalar? OK, good. So I'm going to yeah, just get rid of this. So we have that this is a number, this is a number. So this one is equation 6.0. 21. So the book says several things about this expression. So I wanted to, to test if uh, that's actually true. Um, I guess from a physicist's point of view, I'm not a mathematician. So it says that the numerator can be 0. We're going to test that. Uh, or positive. And it says that the denominator is never zero. And so this value is either zero or positive. So let's see if that is true. Hmm. 
the book says, and this is in different parts of the book, but well, I guess like, the three pages in this section. He says, recall lambda stands for omega squared, which is what we just said. So positive lambda corresponds to uh, real frequencies. So I'm going to write my, I guess, draw the idea that I have when I look at these equations. So I have these eight particles. How do I represent different frequencies? Well, maybe, you know, this can be so we're here have one, two, three. Oops. Okay, whatever. The uh, derivative is not great. This is one possibility, and that means that maybe this particle will stay here. Um, if you have, you know, more of a continuum, you will see them move kind of like this. And then down here, they move like this. And so on. What if I wanted to draw a different frequency? Well, then I will, I can probably do this one. And then you will see these ones. How many frequencies can you have? D distinct frequencies. And each one is going to be a distinct frequency? So what if you have only one dimension? So that you don't have to worry about the three. Only one for each particle. So these are frequencies, these are not particles. How come you can have n distinct frequencies? This live forever. We don't have any damping. They're uh, harmonic motions. The particles have different half masses. Maybe they have different masses. Yeah, they, they will have different masses um, in general. What if they have the same mass? Um, they will, will have a lot because for one particle will have um, its own vibration and then when we have the, the two, mm -hmm. they have like some constructive interference and we have another one, so I guess. Hmm, that's an interesting consideration, but if they interfere with each other, you will have dampening. So these ones do not interact with each other. But 
in, in the real world they won't. When we experience from like a, when you demonstrate for k, and then for k plus one, like if you have one particle, it is plus c. Yeah. If you have two, they can do either this or this. Hmm? And if you have three, they do something weird. Yeah, yeah. I, I think that's the right way to look at it. So each one of these frequencies exists, you know, and um, if you if you look at an ideal solid, you have like all your atoms over here, you know, let's say that it's one dimensional, right? Um, you know, maybe they will be moving like this or they will be moving like this. But you, you can study them. Um, they might look random and, you know, like thermal noise, um, will look like the particles are moving randomly. They're actually not moving randomly. Um, random, I guess, thermal noise uh, is just our inability to understand, to figure out everything. The movement of each particle is the superposition of all the waves. Okay. So that's why they look very random. But these are the, well, these are the normal modes. So the number of, of modes that you're going to have depends on the number of particles that you have in the system. So if you have, um, yeah, like uh, Gustavo was saying, two of these, then you can do this. You know that is one wave. Uh, if you had three, you can create you know this one and this one. So that's why it depends on the number of particles. So it's the number of particles. It is. Um, yeah. Well, you can get that from the math because. The number of eigenvectors and eigenvalues is equal to the number of particles. So, yeah. I think that's what I said. Before. I think that's what you said. Yes. So, but you didn't explain why. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, but that is correct. Okay. So. Uh, so is, is it good to have one normal mode or just a different normal? If they will be different? Or what is the difference? No, I'm asking that in this situation, is it going to be one normal mode or there's several different normal modes? Several. So, you know, I guess an, you can think about when you're like, how do you call it, like jumping, you're doing this with the, <laughs> what do you call it? Hmm? Like, doing that, yes, anyways. So you have this rope, right? And if you have another person over there, you can create, you know, I guess the lowest energy mode will be just like this, and then it just moves like up and down, right? But then if you move it a little bit faster, then you create one with two. If you move it more, it's three. Marcos, don't leave. I have a, a question to ask you. Uh, so what's gonna happen on December 3rd? Because we have a speaker and uh, but it's also that day, so, so Mark Pearson told me to ask you. So we're supposed to have a speaker that day. We do have a speaker. It's gonna be. Well, he, he said there was gonna be a new speaker. Well, there was. There, yeah. Yes, there is so a speaker. It was, it was gonna be. I don't remember. Yuri Kovin or something like that. Yeah, it changed, but there's a person. So, it, I think it might be online. No, it's in person. Person? Yes. So I guess my question is, if he meets with the students, with you guys, should it be on Thursday or on Friday? Well, there's a after seminar. Yes, but yeah. the, fr the seminar is on Friday, which is that day. Yeah. So he does a seminar, the seminar is speaking, right? And after the seminar, the students stay to all right, the die has been cast. Okay. <laughs> Julius Caesar. Okay. Um, so this is what's going on. That's why you know we have these frequencies. They are real uh, because, well, we'll see. So we showed that the lambdas are real. And that is a consequence of the 
uh, kinetic energy and force constant tensor being her mission. Um, and we, we build them actually, so and we check that they are her mission. So another statement that the book makes is neither the numerator, which is, I guess, that one over there, uh, nor denominator can be negative, and the denominator cannot be zero. So uh, this guy over, over here, right? It's a uh, AK. Uh, it's a it's an eigenvector. The eigenvalue is going to be lambda k. The eigenvalue frequency is omega k because we have everything there. And so the Characteristic equation is going to have uh, how many roots? Uh huh. So eight. So it's going to be the number of particles times the you know, how many directions they can move. So it's the number of degrees of freedom, you know, as, as I mentioned before. So. Because of that, your this one is going to look like this. We have V one one A one plus V one two A two plus dot dot dot, and then V one N A N. Okay, so this is a vector, right? And it has n rows. So right here we have um, v, n1, a1, um, n2, a2, and here we have v, um, n, N, A, N. Okay, that is how that matrix looks. So, what does everything mean? Um, the total number of allowed uh, frequencies is going to be N. You get that from the uh, matrix. Um, if you had a highest frequency, what would that be? Well, it would be this one moving in one direction, this one moving in the opposite direction, and all of them doing the same. So, two of them. The lowest energy will be all of them moving in the same direction. So, the same thing as with the rope, right? It will be just like this. And then, like, all of them going down like this. So you have a highest frequency, you have a lowest frequency, and they are they go in discrete values. And I had more drawings, but I guess we can uh, just imagine them at this point. Um, I had one that I messed up a little bit. It will not survive, and it's because it didn't have the appropriate um, what do you call it modulus over here. Like one of them was like not doing anything, right? So if you have a, a limited number, there's only a um, discrete number of frequencies, well-defined number of frequencies that you can have. So there is an amplitude for each of them. Can you imagine this? That if it has lower energy, then the amplitude is longer? I guess it's what you see with the rope. But because you are, you have a given energy, mechanical energy, so kinetic and potential, the energy has to be the same. It's just what is a range is a frequency and the amplitude. So there's a trade-off between those two that um, it has to maintain the, the, the energy. So each one, um, each particle, has its own amplitude. The amplitude can be the same if 
you know, all the particles are the same, but you were talking about, uh, what's it, you and uh, the different, uh, that they could have different amplitudes. What would be, the, how could you achieve that? What would produce a different amplitude? Mm -hmm. Yeah, is it a, like, uh, if you are applying oscillations with, are different from, uh, applying the force are different from, um, like here or here? Like if you apply the force on different on different particles. On different particles? Mm. Yeah, that would definitely one. that would definitely produce a different amplitude. But here we are not actively applying a force. So what we do is we move one of them, so we apply a force initially, we just let go. And because this is a harmonic motion, it will just continue forever. You know, there's no, there's no other force that is dissipating um, the energy, or there's no energy dissipation. Uh, they they will just leave forever. So what can produce a different amplitude? Let's say that this one has like a smaller amplitude than all the other ones. They have different masses. Masses. What else? A different what force transfer? Yep, that's about it. That's the only thing that matters for your W. So different mass or different um, a force constant. You know, the simplest case, uh, well, I don't know if, the, if it's the simplest, but um, I guess a common case, all your particles have the same mass and the force constants are also the same. And so they'll be like, you know, single element, gold or something like that. Uh, if you have different kinds of particles, then, um, things start to get a little bit more complicated. Okay, so, this vector, so each of these rows, um, can it be positive or negative or zero? Move to the particles that are moving to the potential energy can. Yeah, I agree with that. Unless you're looking at something extremely boring, then it's not doing anything. But <laughs> so what about positive or negative? Can they be negative, positive, or zero? Yes. Okay. So, what if what will happen if they're positive? You know, whenever I, I see an equation, I guess it represents a model, right? I want to break it. And the, the book tells you, oh, this is it. It's like, oh, let me let me prove it wrong. They're usually right, but. So if your force constants are negative, what would that mean? When the particles are, like, you are going in this direction, and particles are moving in this direction, like, you change the direction of the uh, Let's do it in one, you know, with one particle and one dimension. So you have, let's say that you have a wall over here, you have your spring constant, or force constant, and you have your particle. So if the force constant is positive, then um, you know, this is the, the origin. The particle moves in this direction, and in what direction is the force? The particle moves in this direction. The particle moves in this direction, the force is? The spring constant, F equals negative KX, uh, Hooke's law. So if it moves in this direction, the force is? If it moves in this direction, the force is? Yeah. It's a positive force constant. 
So if you have a negative first constant, what does it do? It's a repulsion. So, you know, if it moves a little bit in this direction, it's just going to feel a force in that same direction. So it's just going to be. Can you keep it in place? Yes, you can. You have to be extremely careful, but the potential will look like this, right? You can put it in here, but with any displacement, it will just leave. The other option is this is positive, and so if you push it in this direction, it just goes back and it will stay there, right? So you can have definitely negative force constants. Um, Positive force constants, you can also have that. Force constants that are zero, yeah, definitely. Um, and then you have this displacement. But you know, if, if you look at this, this is the potential energy. This is, you know, if you want to, this is a one half of kx squared. You have the displacements here. You have the the force constant. It's just in many dimensions, but. It is, uh, it is Hooke's law. So when we put this other guy over here, the A star, what's gonna happen to this? Well, this, this is gonna become a number. So it's gonna be, you know, this one, well, I guess the, the correct uh, row times this one, and then, then this one, and so on. So it's gonna be, um, I'm going to put it over here. So it's A1 star B11 A1 um, B12 A2 dot 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 plus A2 star stuff here plus the rest. Okay? But this ends up being, I guess I can put the last one. Um, this is just a number, uh, and when you move, put, put this one with this one, what do you get? Mm, yeah, times something, right? The, the, the values. So this is a this is a square. So it cannot be. Um, it cannot be negative. Okay. At best, it is zero. And you have, this is an addition of everything, right? So you can have these that are negative. In the end, you're going to have only one number. So this number is either is, is either going to be uh, it's going to produce a stable equilibrium or an unstable equilibrium. So if you have you know the right combination of negative values, uh, negative force constants, you know maybe all of them are negative, then what the book tells you doesn't hold. But that's a system that you cannot really study. So actually what they say is, uh, if this is positive, then you have stable equilibrium. If this is negative, then this is unstable and you cannot study it. Which, yeah, it's a, I guess it's a good deal. Okay, so, Yeah, so the math allows you to have a negative matrix product, but not really the physics. Um, you might even have oscillations, you know, um, once, once it is like unstable, maybe we'll like oscillate a little bit, but eventually, you know, it, it just um, is going to go to uh, infinity, and this one is the ace, because it will just continue moving farther and farther away. So I'm going to talk very briefly about 
chaos because I think you didn't get to that part of the book. So, We're going to see that the third way of describing um, a system, I think I mentioned this in the first lecture, uh, is we, uh, you will have the position degrees of freedom. So in Euclidean space will be um, you know, X, Y, and Z, and the, the momentum, so it will be the velocities. So just like with Lagrangian mechanics, we have um, a space that is 3n dimensional, where n is the number of degrees of freedom, you can represent the same information in this other space. So over here you have the position, and here you have the velocity, essentially. Um, I guess times the mass. If you have a system, then you will have one of these six dimensional points for each particle. You know, typically you will be able to describe it in terms of its center of mass or something like that. So it's not as bad, but this is the more general definition. So the simplest case will be for simple harmonic motion. How does it look? One particle moving in simple harmonic motion. How does it look in this, in this space? So I guess if you want to, you can look at it this way. Over here you have your center of mass, I mean your, uh, your turning point at some position. And what is the velocity at the turning point? You guys want to say it, but you can't. Zero? Yes, zero. Right, and then you have your other turning point over here. Um, over here at the bottom, you have maximum kinetic energy. So this one's going to be maximum. It's going to be over here. You have another one over here. And this just looks like a circle, or I guess a, it doesn't have to be a circle, but it is. Um, like a circle, could be elongated a little bit in this direction or in this direction. But, you know, we, we saw it before. This was a solution for the, uh, the precession. Let's say cosine theta. This is the position. Um, I guess you can have like omega t over here. And then the y-axis is omega a this is the velocity. Yes, velocity. Sine omega t negative. It goes backward, yeah. the velocity. So, yes, it's just that. So, the more interesting cases will be. Uh, did I leave the black one? Okay.
let's say that you have one over here, starts here, and it is moving in the position velocity space. So maybe we'll look kind of like this. Maybe, maybe like that, maybe like that, maybe like this, so on. And at some point, it gets kind of too close in this direction, and then it just moves here. Um, is this possible? Or is this describing like something that exists in reality? Gravity. Yeah. So you will have maybe. Um, what could it be? Maybe it will be like a, like a ternary system, right? And you have like two masses that are kind of bigger, and then another one that is tiny, and it's kind of moving in between these two. Yeah, definitely. So um, the region over here in which this is a stable, this will be a harmonic motion. This is called a, an attractor. So over here we have two attractors. Seems like there's one over here. So attractor one. And over here we have another one, attractor two. There are uh, two kinds of motion. Uh, there's periodic, and this one is periodic. You can have periodic motion and more than one attractor. It's not an issue. Maybe it will look like like that, right? In the velocity position plot. Um, something like this that doesn't repeat. It's called a um, what do you call it? Chaotic, of course. It's a chaotic attractor. So something like this can be represented by a manifold, or like that one. But this one, not really. So if you want to find the topological shape that you know, represents this will be a fractal. So if the attractor is represented by a fractal, is, it is called a uh, strange attractor. Yes. What kind of move? No, move. Is it? What kind of movement are we describing? Like long signal, the transverse, or the reverse one? So, the way I'm doing it, I'm writing it, drawing it here, is one dimensional because we have one dimension for the position and one dimension for the velocity. This is not in Euclidean space, this is in phase space. Hmm. Um, but in general, you're going to have three degrees for the uh, position and three degrees for the, for the velocity. So the phase space is six dimensional. Um, but this case, for example, um, probably you know, the, the, the movement of the tiny body around the two more massive ones is going to be chaotic. So you're not going to easily find a periodicity. And maybe the periodicity doesn't like exist at all. And so the, the fractal nature is necessary because you need to have like bifurcation points. Like, you know, if it's over here, it will go this way. But if it's like, you know, a tenth of a millimeter this way, it's gonna go this way. So it's like very sensitive to the initial conditions. And the initial conditions, you know, the 
it's not that you are not able to measure well enough what's, what, what's happening. This is inherent in the system. So if you look at the simulations of you know, what's gonna happen to the solar system, I think the best ones are like 200 million years. Like you cannot really know uh, what's gonna happen beyond that because like the tiny effects of um, you know, like Mercury, for example, uh, the, the gravity, uh, eventually like they propagate throughout your system, your simulation, by the, the solar system. And so you know, there's like a 2% chance or something like that that the Earth is going to be kicked out of the solar system in the next like 200 million years. Um, we just don't know. And it is like inherently chaotic. So there's, this is not about your measurement being bad. It's just about um, how the, really the potential energy surface changes and produces these vivification forms. So if you think about it, there's a lot of systems that are um, chaotic and that can be described by attractors. For example, um, weather and climate change and pretty much everything in economics. So everything that is a complex system is going to have um, strange attractors that, you know, it, they're essentially these, but with complexity. So you, know, you have a part that is just kind of periodic and another one that is chaotic and unpredictable. So, well, I guess climate will change enough that it gets out of this part. But for the most part, you know, it's going to be just moving from one side to the other, cold or low, whatever. So this is really cool, I think. Um, oh shoot, okay. So we can do a similar analysis like we did for the, for the potential energy here. We can do it for the kinetic energy. So the kinetic energy, the elements of the kinetic energy are the M's, you know, M1, 2, uh, I guess 1, 1, M1, 2, M1, 3, um, and so on. This one is more difficult to break the kinetic energy because the masses cannot be positive. I mean, cannot be negative, as opposed to to the force constants. And so the only way that you can have these to be zero, you know, since over here you're going to have a square, and over here you have a positive. Well, the square is a positive too. The only way that you can have this one as zero is if there's no kinetic energy. But you know, as you mentioned over here, if you have a movement, if you have a displacement, then you're going to have kinetic energy. It's not a, an option. And you know, if you want to study a system that doesn't do anything, well, I guess that's, that's your choice. So that one, you know, it, it, it's good. Like for any system that matters or that you're interested in, it's going to be positive. This one, you can arrange it to be negative if you really want, I mean, zero if you really want. Uh, but if it's negative, then we're just going to become a system that you don't really. What's the relationship between the potential and the kinetic energy? Oh, that's the beautiful part. So, um, well, you know, if you have a system with, you know, Hooke's law, spring or elastic potential energy, and then the kinetic energy, what is the relationship? Well, I think it's equal, like, the the kinetic energy. Energy is conserved, right? So the, the same thing has to happen here. So, you know, these A's, you can just put them all in a, you can just put them all in a, in a matrix. I guess it's a tensor. Call it A. And this one. And 
and then you have the T over here. So the same, the same matrix has to uh, diagonalize the matrix of force constants and the matrix of masses or kinetic energy. So I think this is pretty incredible. Yeah, right. Well, I guess it could not be other, any, any other way, but it's just. Amazing. So this one over here, if it is orthogonal, and the condition for it to be orthogonal is that each one of these, or I guess each of the eigenvectors has only one non-zero value, right? So it'll be like this one, this one, this one. So if this one is orthogonal, which means that you have n distinct eigenvalues then because of the properties it was her mission and everything, this one is equal to this one. So if we just replace it, this is going to be the case, you know, not always, but definitely in some cases. What is this? Yeah, so that is the um, the similarity transformation, right? So, because this is uh, a tensor, so like a square matrix, this is going to give you a, a diagonalization of the force constant matrix. And this one gives you a diagonalization. So remember that the force constant is the second derivative of the potential energy, and this is the kinetic energy. So it diagonalizes both of them. What happens if you have, uh, well, I guess this is going to be just perfectly determined, right? It's not underdetermined or overdetermined. It is just determined. So the condition for that, um, well, I guess it's not the condition, but the, the, the consequence is that you can put all the eigenvalues, so these ones, in a diagonal matrix. And then so it's going to look like this. One, two, and sorry about my two. It's always confusing. So this is the algebra. This is, well, I guess you can get it from this one. And if we put this one over here, and this one over here, so on both sides, um, this is going to be one. Um, we saw it in the previous class. And this one is going to be diagonal. So it's going to be a diagonal matrix. And it's going to be 1 and this diagonal matrix of um, eigenvalues. So before, you know, the, the condition to have a um, diagonal tensor, for example, for example, the um, the moment of inertia tensor, we only needed to apply this transformation. So it was the negative on one side and then the other one on the other side. Um, in this case, we need two things. We need to diagonalize V and we need that this one is equal to the identity matrix. So there's an additional constraint, but the, the, the math 
you can extend it to n dimensions, and it works pretty much the same. So the, the consequence of these, because this is a, an important point, we're trying to figure out you know, how to break this one. But, or this one. But this forces you to have, you're not going to have all the off-diagonal elements. So you're just going to have A11, uh, V11, A1, A1, A1 star, plus A2 star, V22, a to uh, plus so on. So this one you can still make it negative, but this one is always going to be positive. And what this is telling you is that like, if you don't have this element, If you don't have this one, that means that all your degrees of freedom are orthogonal. And that's why these vibrations can live on forever. That's why they don't interact. So it's kind of, math, it's kind of nice how the math you know, ends up describing the system. So in reality, and I guess, um, my research is on what happens when they do interact. But in order to do that, we have to go to a higher order. So this is harmonic. You only have interactions between um, two particles, between all the particles, but only two at a time. And if you remember the uh, diagram that I drew before, you know when, they, when you consider the interactions that are three-body or four-body, you know, higher order, is when you get you know, all this additional physics that doesn't arise from these harmonic models. So for example, in solids, this creates thermal expansion and heat conductivity. So the fact that you don't, not all the materials have the same heat conductivity is because the interaction between the, the waves is different. And I guess we call them phonons, but this is general, you know, in, in any system that is oscillating. So in that case, uh, it is not symmetric, the, the phosphor symmetry? Or? It is symmetric, but it, it's, a, it's a tensor of rank three. Oh. So you have a bunch of other things. And so these ones, um, are not, um, so you're gonna have three of these, right? One for each particle. So they move in different directions. And in that case, you cannot de-entangle the degrees of freedom like you do here. So they are entangled. Um, so that's why I think that this is really cool. <laughs> All right, guys, uh, let's go. Have a good weekend, long weekend. Eat a lot of turkey or other things, tofurkey, whatever.